right? Yes. Um, so thank you all for, for being here. Um, this is my first ever public talk, so if you have any feedback afterwards on how I did the talk, please do let me know. I'd appreciate it a lot. If you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand and, and I'll, I'll go around as, uh, as you appear. Um, I just flew in two days ago from, uh, from Dublin, so uh, I'm quite jet lagged. If I start to ramble incoherently or speak Dutch, which sounds the exact same, <laughs> please give me a nudge and I'll try and rephrase things. Um, so what I'm talking about today is uh, what makes some product teams great and others not so much. Uh, this is very much in the context of Riot Games, uh, so it may or may not apply uh, to your company. Uh, what I hope you guys get out of this is really a view of how Riot sees this problem and what we're doing with this information. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Kohn Hendricks. Uh, uh, I'm Dutch, uh, hence the weird first name. Uh, I have been with Riot for four and a half, nearly five years now, and throughout the time I've been involved as a development manager within our security team. Um, most of my time I spend herding cats, uh, make sure we do the right things the right way, um, and, and make sure we get things done on time. Um, on the side, I've been focused a lot recently on how teams within Riot do or don't do security and see if there's stuff that we can distill from, from those teams and apply that elsewhere. Um, I've split up the content in, in five parts. Uh, first, I'll give you guys some more context about what Riot is, what the culture is, what the engineering culture is, as that context sets a lot of, of the tone of, of the rest of this talk. And I'll then share a little bit about what my viewpoint in that is, and then I'll share the, uh, the challenge of answering the question, why are some teams great and why are others not so great? Um, I'll then give a little bit of, uh, of info on how we are trying to improve the, the game at Riot. Um, so to quickly set a bit of the stage uh, about Riot, um, I'll share a little bit about who we are and what we do and what the history is. So Riot was founded in 2006 uh, with the mission to be the most player-focused games company in the world. And that means that everything the company does is viewed through the lens of, okay, how much value does this give to our players? And the same goes for security. If we want to take on an initiative, we will be asked, okay, how does this improve life for our players? Um, we currently have one game out in production. Uh, it's called uh, League of Legends, which was launched in 2009. Uh, you play this five versus five online, uh, and it's, it's a very strong, competitive, team-oriented game. Uh, and it's very, like I said, very competitive. There's a large esports scene behind it. Uh, there's currently about 143, I believe, unique characters you can pick from. And every 30-minute session, you can pick a new champion. So every game, every session you play is going to be different. And that uh, gets a lot of people hooked. Um, Back when League was just released in 2009, Riot was very much just a small startup with only about 40 to 50 people working there. And the game grew incredibly fast. So this number is from 2016. So in seven years' time, the game grew from just not being released to having to support 100 million users every month. And that was, that's quite a growth. To kind of further illustrate that, uh, every year we have a, a world championship. And in season one, you can see this was a dream hack in Sweden. It was just, just a small booth and maybe a few dozen people there. All a bunch of nerds were playing video games, right? Um, in season two, we had the Galen Center here in LA completely filled to the brim, about 8,000 people there. Season three, the Staples Center, also here in LA. Season four, we managed to uh, fill up a, a soccer stadium in Korea and Seoul, also completely filled to the brim. In season five, the Mercedes-Benz Arena in Berlin. Season six, the uh, Staples Center again here in LA. And in the end of 2017, we went to the Bird's Nest in China, uh, which also got absolutely filled up. I believe it was like 70,000 people there. So League had to keep scaling with those numbers. And when a company is in that phase where it just wants to keep operating and get people to even play the game, their priority is not going to be security. Their priority is keeping the engine running. So currently, the current world in 2019 is we have over 20 offices. And almost every one of these offices it does to some extent some engineering work, whether they do it themselves or whether they outsource it. There's some technical component happening in nearly every office. Um, we have, I think this number is a little bit outdated already, about 3,500 people working at Riot. And about 700 of those work in engineering. And the values of our engineering group are uh, player focus, total ownership, one team, and continuous improvement. And especially the total ownership and player focus part make it harder for security to get involved. 
Because what that means is that any product team at Riot completely owns what they built, how they build it, how they organize themselves, and they, they not only control that, they completely own that. We can't just go in and tell teams, you have to do X, Y, and Z. They, they can easily defy us and, and go about with their lives. So the challenges that we have is it's sometimes just really hard to get security in there for teams. So there's teams at Riot, every product team has a super high degree of independence, autonomy, and freedom to organize themselves whichever way they want because their focus is to deliver more value to our players. And that unfortunately means that security isn't always where we want it to be. Um, and only over the past few years, we've been gradually been able to get ahead of the game and improve significantly. Um, and we've done that by becoming a lot more proactive. So uh, rather than mandating heavy security checklist of 400 pages long, we just go in there, have a lightweight and applicable conversation or a lightweight and applicable tool the teams can adopt um, and that has proven a lot more successful for us. Um, the guys at Etsy put it really nicely, and we have this printed out as a poster in both our Dublin and uh, Los Angeles office here. Um, if security introduces blocking to your organization, it will be ignored, not embraced. This is one of the core pillars that our security team operates by. Because if we make it really hard for teams to do the actual work to deliver their, their software to products to our players, they're not going to work with us, or they're not going to want to work with us. So for us, it's nearly impossible to mandate top-down security or to make security become gatekeepers before teams can release. Um, so yeah, the guys at Etsy, they had it right all along. Um, so this is where I come in. This is what my vantage point is. So as a role in the role of development manager within security, I have been in a lucky and privileged position to interact with a lot of teams, a lot of product teams that come to us with various requests and reviews and, and comments and concerns. And that allowed me to build up a bit of a perspective to see how some teams at Riot do or don't do security and how those teams succeed or fall short on security. And they tend to do that in quite similar ways. So over the past few years, I've, I've learned quite a bit about security, but here are the key three lessons that I learned. Um, preaching to the choir to those teams that are doing security fantastically doesn't move the needle. So when we release a new tool or new process or a new uh, workflow for teams to do things more securely, those fantastic teams, they will adopt it, but that doesn't necessarily improve the security posture of the company. The teams that need to adopt it, that we want to adopt, we are not reaching them because they will typically ignore it. So if we're purely focused on optional tooling and processes, we're not really moving the needle. Um, secondly, many teams regard security as a phase they have to go through. They don't see it as an ongoing process. They're like, we build something, oh, we deploy it, Let's, let's get some security work done, maybe a review, and there you go, off to production. Uh, but we know that nowadays there's a lot of patches happening, a lot of updates happening, new features being pushed to production. So five months down the line, that security review we did is moot, is obsolete. It's just a snapshot in time. And, and third, there are somehow those magical teams that do everything perfectly right and kind of the point of this talk, we haven't really been able to figure out what that magical thing is. Um, so those teams have the right, somehow have the right processes, the right tools, and make the right tech choices. Um, but yeah, we don't really know what that is. So obviously, recently, what I've been trying to figure out is what makes those special teams, those magical unicorns, what makes them so special? So um, trying to figure out what processes these teams use, what, uh, what tech stacks they use, what kind of conversations they're having, and see if there's anything we can distill from that and apply that to other product teams uh, within Riot. Um, yes. Um, before diving into the meat of that, I want to emphasize the disclaimer. Um, I don't need to explain to anyone here that security is a difficult and nuanced topic. Uh, but what I'm sharing with you guys here is valuable for us at Riot and in the context of a highly agile company where all the teams are very autonomous. Uh, this may not be relevant for you at your company, uh, and I'm definitely not saying this is a silver bullet, but for us, it, it helps. Um, this is only one of many security efforts we have ongoing at Riot, so I'll be sharing some numbers later on. Those are representative of all the security efforts, not just these efforts. Um, we're focused here on elevating the bar. We will never get to a perfect secure world, especially as long as those teams are completely independent, and that's fine. 
we just want to make things a little bit better than what they used to be. So um, what I'm going to share now is how we tried to answer this question. How did we, um, how did we approach this and, and what are the results of that question? So I went about over to 10, 15 teams in Riot, and we have about 80 of them, um, and asked them within the team, how do you guys collaborate on, uh, on, on security? Um, and I asked a bunch of questions, or I took notes on a bunch of questions, is when those teams sit together and talk about the work they're going to do, do they talk about security? If so, who talks about security? Is there only one person, or is it all 10 people in the room? Um, what do they do with that conversation? Does it go into uh, the abyss of a whiteboard or JIRA, or do they actually make something useful out of it? Um, and how do people react when those conversations happen in the first place? Um, so for most of the teams, those 10, 15 teams, I sat in on a couple of, uh, of their sessions, and I just watched and observed. I asked them permission to do that, and that was all. I didn't raise my hand, I didn't say anything. That was all I did. Um, and I did that twice for about a month during 2018, and notes, 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 I took a lot of notes. So I started looking at those notes, and yes, some patterns started to emerge. There were definitely groups of teams that exhibit similar behavior, um, and potentially similar results. Um, and as we are a games company, obviously we call those levels. And you can kind of see that as a maturity model. So on the left, we have what we call level one teams. And in level one teams, um, security awareness is, is kind of limited. It uh, doesn't mean that these people don't care about security. It just they don't really get to think about it. It's not really coming up in the conversations. Um, if that team has seasoned developers, it can still produce pretty decent quality code. If they have a bunch of junior developers, um, you probably want to get uh, involved more closely there. Um, things get better when we move to level two. Uh, these teams, for them, security is still reactive. Um, what we see here typically are key stakeholders or a tech lead in team that says, hey guys, let's think about security. And these are the typical teams that see security as that phase right before they release. Um, so typically what we see here, team bolts on security after they did that security review phase or security uh, phase in their development, and that's about it. The challenge with these teams is that because security is dependent on that one tech uh, lead or one security advocate or that one stakeholder that does value security, as soon as those people are removed from the equation, this team will drop back to, uh, to a level one team. And that kind of means that security for this team is unsustainable. Um, but it gets better when we reach level three. So for level three teams, security is just part of nearly every conversation. And they kind of have a force mechanic to do that. For them, it's really a muscle. If they have a planning session, part of the agenda items will be, let's talk about security. Um, however, it's not natural to them. It's something that needs to be brought up over and over again. Uh, but the whole team values that conversation, and they will actively engage in it. So it's no longer just one or two people caring about security, it's the whole team having that conversation. And that means that for these teams, security has now become a sustainable practice that they will keep on, on going for a, a long period of time. So that's, that's better. And then we get to these, these magical teams, the level four teams, uh, as we call them. Um, I, I mentioned that we were, were trying to distill what those teams are doing, see if there's practices we can apply to other teams. The answer to that is we cannot. Because for these teams, security is like breathing. They will automatically do it, every conversation. It doesn't need to be brought up. They will automatically think about it. Um, and that means that security is a lot better, but it's very hard to say this team has these and these practices. Another interesting thing that we found was that, especially in level four teams, uh, not so much in level three teams, but also a little bit, is that there's a very strong fo uh, focus from the leadership of the team and the people above that on security, trust, and integrity. So that's where the product owner will say, no, we hold off release to get better security versus more value to players uh, over security. Um, in our limited data set and experience, teams that reach level four are typically working in highly sensitive areas like authentication or, uh, or web shops kind of, kind of teams. Um, we are seeing more regular product teams get close to level four, so we're keeping an eye on that in, in the future. Um, while I'm describing levels, this really it should be seen as a continuous spectrum. So a team being level two and a half is, is absolutely possible. 
So we got all this, these levels and we realized, okay, well, that's all nice and fun, but does it really mean anything? Can we see where most of the teams at Riot are at? So we went through that exercise and we drafted up this model. I wanted to see if we could see the bigger picture at Riot. So we did this at the end of 2017 with all 80-ish engineering team that we have at Riot, obviously excluding the security teams because that would be cheating. And um, we based this information on, okay, what kind of conversations are we having with those teams? What kind of things do we see in bug bounty and security reviews? Do those people reach out to us in general? If yes, what kind of questions are we getting? And, and out of that, we, we were able to bring up these, these uh, statistics. So this was not entirely unexpected. We are seeing a lot of teams in level one and level two. Um, a handful of teams in level three and four, so there are definitely some rock star teams in Riot, uh, but there's plenty of room for improvement. Um, what we also found was traditionally the teams that are in level one, we typically have a very hard time communicating with. Those are the teams in the local offices where security isn't physically present, or teams where a lot of development is being outsourced. So it's a lot harder to get security even part on, uh, uh, part of being part of their radar. So, okay, nice and fun. We have uh, now an... The percentage of level one, level two, level three teams. Yeah, yeah, but what's the y-axis? That's the x-axis. What's the y-axis? Oh, yeah, that's the just... The number of penetrations that you occur to that game? No, just the number of teams. And within Riot, that are level one or two, oh, okay. a percentage of the total. Did you find it? Um, we did not look at that, but my gut feeling says yes. Um, so, yeah, we looked at all that data and figured, okay, that's all nice. We now know where teams are. Does it really matter whether a team is level four or level one? Can we actually see an impact on that on, on the bottom line of what a team does? So Riot has a bug bounty program, and we're very happy with that. And that gives us a lot of interesting data. So over all bugs that were reported over 2017, we looked at, OK, which team built this product? And what level are they? Great. And we started uh, looking at the metrics that way. So uh, when we look at, we're going to look at two statistics. The average payout on the bug bounty issue and the average time it takes a team to fix a high-risk issue, because those are the ones you want to fix fastest, immediately, typically. So we set it, uh, we average and index it out on uh, $1 for a level one team, and for one unit of time uh, for the average time it takes to fix a high-risk issue. In level two teams, we already saw a huge improvement. The average pay for a bug bounty issue went down to 80 cents on the dollar, and the average time it took these, uh, sorry, took those teams to fix a high-risk issue, up to 65% of the time level one needed. When we went to level three teams, it improved even further. Uh, they, on bug bounty issues, on average paid only 65 cents on the dollar compared to level one teams. And the time it took them to fix high risk issues was less than half uh, of what it takes uh, a level one team. And in level four teams, it again gets better where the average payout drops to 55 cents on the dollar and the average time it takes them to fix a high risk issue uh, drops to less than a third compared to level one teams. So not just bug bounty, but also security reviews we looked at. Uh, and we see some, some different type of, of engagement that we get out of those teams. So level one teams, they rarely come to us for security reviews when they release something. And when we want some, to review something, because we feel it may be sensitive, um, we typically have to do a lot more poking and pulling on getting all the right information, getting it properly set up. For level two teams, it's already a lot better. Typically, it's only a natural reminder saying like, hey, we want to review this, and typically the team will get it set up and, and ready for us in very short notice. So that's already much better. In level three teams, as I said, they always think about security. It's part of the formal agenda. So we practically always get security reviews uh, for level three teams. And level four teams, um, we see an interesting second behavior. They not just only send us reviews for their big features or big new products. They will also come to us for check-ins on hey, we're modifying this sensitive code. Can you guys give us a second pair of eyes? So that allows us to very quickly turn around on their requests as it will only take us a few hours or a few days to, to review those, uh, those changes. Um, so we took all the, uh, all the review reports we had of 2017 and looked at if this issue was reported via bug bounty, what would we pay out on it? And again, we set it on $1 for a level one team. In level two teams, uh, we see the average issue severity drop to 70 cents on the dollar. For level three teams, we saw it drop to 65 cents on the dollar. And for level four teams, we saw it drop to uh, 58 cents on the dollar. So both reviews and bug bounty are quite well in line. 
Um, and we are really seeing significant changes in impact that it has on the security posture of a product, with, uh, depending on what level that a team is at. Um, I am aware that this is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, teams that do think more about security will produce more secure products. But it's kind of nice to finally have some numbers to support that and be able to bring that to, uh, to other teams and, and uh, stakeholders to say security is important. Um, so next part, I'll explain what we are trying to do with this information. How are we trying to, to level up security at Riot? Um, so how do we use and, and apply this framework? So the level that a team is at for us changes how we approach that team. So, right, we have those level three and four teams. When we uh, bring, release a new process or tool, yeah, those guys will immediately adopt it. But they don't need it as much as those level one and two teams. Um, so what we try and do is figure out, okay, where is this team at? If they are a level one or two team, they won't adopt our process or our formal tooling unless we really force them to. And we don't really want to do that, as I mentioned. Um, so first, what we need to do is level up the actual amount of care that those teams have to think and work on, uh, on security. So um, we need to figure out how can we move those level one or two teams up on, on this model. So we've seen what the current landscape looks like. Um, what do we want to do in the future? So going from level three to four takes a really long time and effort. Uh, that usually is, is a multi-year journey. And the statistics you just saw, they show that the return on investment there is, is pretty low. However, going from level one or two to level three is a huge uh, improvement. So we know we have a bunch of level one or two teams on our belt, and we're trying to figure out how we can move those teams to level three. Um, if you take a further look at what you actually see written down here, a lot of this is conversation and process based. It's not necessarily, uh, sorry, not necessarily technical competence based. Um, so that means that a lot of the changes, we would encourage our teams to uh, change how they work day by day rather than top down security requirements. So, um, yeah. so we needed to draw up a systematic approach for teams that they could easily talk about security um, on whatever it is that they're working on at any moment in a lightweight manner, but still try to be as complete as possible. And that was really difficult. So we started looking at a bunch of, of commonly used methods like stride, uh, threat modeling, but we found that that was already way too heavy. Having a, a, a 30 minute conversation every sprint planning, there's no team at Riot that will sign up for that. Um, so we needed to go more lightweight than that. Uh, because remember, teams at Riot are highly independent and autonomous. So whatever we want them to do, it has to be lightweight and easy and applicable. Um, so yes, lightweight and easy and applicable. So when we talk to engineers at Riot, what we know is that every engineer wants to write secure code. The challenge is they don't always consider security. So when we have conversations with our engineers, they typically know what the most common vulnerability threats are, how to protect against that. Um, but they just don't always get to think about it. So we know that all we need to do is prime them to think about security. We don't need to come with, with 400 page checklists to them to think about everything. We just need to get them in the right mindset. Um, so every team at Riot uses some form of, of agile development and those all evolve around user stories. Basically what they, they're doing with that is that story on the Jira or Faro Trello board to make sure that a conversation happens in which the product owner explains, this is what I want it to look like, this is how it should feel like, and the engineers will talk about what kind of code challenges they have, and the designer will talk about what kind of design challenges he has, and a, a, a team-wide conversation happens there. So we wanted to get in on, on, on that action. Um, so we started to figure out, okay, how can we do that? How can we make security part of that conversation? And once again, it has to be lightweight and easy. If it's, if it's a, a long conversation, teams are gonna throw it out of windows straight away. So after some brainstorming, we came up with, uh, with one security question and the emphasis is on one security question. We only want these teams to ask themselves one question on every item that they're having in their sprint. Um, and that is this question. Um, how can a malicious user intentionally abuse this functionality and how can we prevent that? I know it's technically a question and a half, but <laughs> we'll go with it. Um, and we want this team just have this conversation for two or three minutes, and that's it. No more, no less, just, just have the conversation. 
And if the team concludes that, yeah, no, we can't come up with any security considerations, that's, that's fine with us. At least if they have the conversation, we know that it will already be quite a bit better. So how does this look like in the wild? So I'm bringing with me uh, some examples, two of them, and both of them are in a product called Battlegrounds, which is what tournament organizers in the community can use to organize their own tournament. So you want to make brackets, you want to organize people to play your tournament, uh, group stages, yada, 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 organize a tournament, everything can go with this tool. Um, this team consists out of a, uh, about five engineers, a scrum master, a designer, a QA tech, and a product owner. Um, so we got them in the room, or they got themselves in the room at a sprint planning, and we sat in while they were trialing this, and we just asked them, have the conversation. Um, so this is the first example I have. Um, the team wanted, needed a functionality that allowed tournament organizers to create mass tournaments. Think of 5,000 people playing a tournament. Um, it would be a little bit too much work to sign all the players and team them one by one. So they want to have something simple like upload a CSV with all the names in it and, and go from there. Um, so the team had already drafted up everything minus the two items on, on the bottom. And they had the conversation. And what they realized was, okay, yeah, we need to do some, some logs on who uploads the file, some validation that we're actually talking about a CSV file. Uh, but then on the second item, something interesting happened. The engineer that was assigned this item had not yet thought about that. This actually had to be prompted by another engineer who said, okay, what if someone provides us with a malicious player name or a malicious team name? What do we do then? And that conversation happened. And now this was part of the exempt criteria of this piece of work. Ergo, the team now built something slightly more secure. Um, the second one was also an interesting uh, example. Um, talking about a feature that would allow players who were in the tournament to ask for help from the tournament organizer. Um, all they would do is click a button that says, I'm gonna chat with the organizer, and a, a chat window would open. And it was actually the product owner of this team uh, who was not technical at all who asked during the, the security conversation, okay, what if someone would just rapidly click that button? And the team started having a conversation and they actually realized, well, damn yes, actually a denial of service vector exists there. Uh, the team found that the scope or, uh, was somewhat limited, so they opted for a, a low effort solution. But this conversation happened and that meant that security leveled up for this team. And because of these conversations, now this team has moved on to a, a become a level three team over the last year. So in both cases, because of this conversation taking place, we get better results uh, overall. So this was a very successful trial uh, of teamwork. So there are some caveats to this though, unfortunately. Um, let me start by saying that this is a difficult muscle for teams to develop. Right? Starting to think like a breaker or having a two minute mini threat modeling session is not easy. Um, it took teams on average like four or five weeks before they really start to get the hang of it and start doing this on their own. Um, so it takes time, um, but that's fine. Um, secondly, is this exercise is absolutely not perfect. Um, we were sitting in a room, myself and one of the security engineers on my team, and we could come up with like 20 other things to do when you upload a CSV file. Um, but we didn't speak up because we want this to scale. We don't want this to be perfect because we cannot be in every planning session. So it needs to be scalable. And we do that by just having a light conversation within the team. And we just sat back uh, in, in the room, not getting too involved. So after a year of working on many fronts, we, uh, we pulled similar numbers again. Um, and we looked at, okay, where is Riot at? <laughs> at the end of 2018. And what we see is that a bunch of teams move from level one to level two, and some teams move from level two to three. So overall, we saw quite a bit of progress. There's still a lot of work to be done, but we're moving in the right direction. So next steps um, with this work is um, the security question that I just mentioned. We have integrated that in the SDLC, the secure development lifecycle that we're trying to roll out to our teams in that we try and train and educate teams to just have this conversation. Or SLC is really focused on lightweight interactions, and we basically say to teams, we want you to, take, to do X, Y, and Z, and let us know about A, B, and C, but that's all. You don't need to perform uh, 
long strenuous actions, except for the review, that's still something we, we really want to do. Um, secondly, we are, are trying to figure out, okay, how can we get better at measuring this? Right now it's super time intensive, um, and a lot of the uh, indicators that we have are rather lagging rather than leading. So what are the key takeaways I hope you guys get out of my talk? Um, first and foremost, go and try and have a look at what teams are doing. Sit with them for a few weeks, have a conversations, sit in on their planning sessions, and figure out that way, what are they working on? How do they work? And do the solutions that you have in mind actually fit with their model of operating? Because if you're an agile organization and your ideas go against what these teams are doing, they're not going to accept it. Um, Obviously, like I mentioned earlier, teams that talk more about security will do better at security. Um, but if you have teams that aren't good at security, focus on using lightweight conversation tools to get them started and think about security more often rather than coming to them with massive tools or, or significant processes that may be very hard uh, to adopt. So, um, Thank you a lot for your time. I do appreciate it a lot. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. If not now, I'll stay around for a while. Thank you. Uh, shameless plug for my employer. We are looking for people in security. So if you want, take a look at our website. Uh, yeah. Um, you mentioned the lightweight tools other than the security question you have. Did you use any other tools to improve the levels? Um, Yes, so we're trying more focus more on conversations like more formal threat modeling at the design phase. And we're trying to figure out if there's a way we can teach teams to do that themselves while still giving the right value without it being an eight hour conversation. So those kind of things we have constantly ongoing. So between 2017 and 2018, did you guys ever notice any teams slip and drop their uh, security level? Yes, especially teams dropping from level two to one uh, because a security champion or advocate left the team. Uh, we did see that happen, yes. For, for teams that don't want to do security, have you thought about just subjecting them to unsolicited adversarial review? <laughs> <laughs> we have a bug bunny program that gets pretty close. So that kind of helps, right? Yeah. Um, do you tell the teams their levels, and do they ever take offense to being rated lower than they'd prefer to be? Uh, the latter uh, answer, obviously, is yes. Um, offense, I wouldn't call it offense, but people will feel hurt about being not good at something. Uh, Riot is a very competitive place, so people are typically gamers, so they want to improve. So we find it more of, of a good stick to, to use rather than a, a damaging thing. And uh, one more question. Uh, prior to your intervention, did uh, the level four team simply consist of more senior engineers? Or uh, was there any other demographic composition that led to them happening to be better so at they security? Had, they had, on average, senior engineers. I wouldn't call it more senior engineers. Uh, but they were working in very uh, security sensitive areas. That's the only commonality that we found. How long do your teams stay together? Uh, that really varies from team to team. So some teams stayed together for years on end. So one of the, the two teams that we had level four in first year, those have been together in nearly the same composition for like four or five years. We also have teams that do a quick spike of three or four months and then they realize that that product isn't viable and that they'll yeah, uh, get broken up and team, people move to other things. So, so you, so, sounds like you kind of do see a correlation between teams that stay whole over a longer period of time to kind of getting a higher security consciousness of some sort? Yes and no. So we do see that some teams that were level three were relatively fresh, but because they brought in people that do, did care a lot about security and were able to quickly teach the rest of the team to care about security, mm -hmm. that they nearly immediately start off as a level two or level three team. Oh, nice. Do you use any code analysis tools or offer training to bump your engineers' acuity to security? Uh, we've had challenges with finding training that engineers found valuable and uh, relevant to what they were doing. So we currently don't have formal training. We do uh, frequently run like CTFs and those kind of things to kind of pique their interest. Uh, we have a bunch of static analysis tools. Um, one of the challenges that we have at Riot is that because every team is free to do what they want, 
we have over 20 languages in use, and I don't know how many frameworks and libraries in use. So it's really hard to do static analysis effectively that way. Um, so our headquarters is here in LA, and we have about four or five offices that mostly do development. Uh, but as I mentioned, practically every office has an engineer or someone who leads technical efforts or even a community manager that says, hey, we need a new website spun up, and they'll engage with a third-party developer. Do you have a consistent kind of culture across these four or five? Relatively, yeah. Seems like it, right? Yeah. Cool. So, so you said uh, you disclose levels. Uh, do you disclose levels just to the developer and not make the public? Uh, what do you mean with public? Meaning everybody knows their level, but nobody knows the other person's level. Uh, we will only tell a team what their own level is. We won't share them. You compare to how they compare to other teams. Okay. Correct. So then the, how does it? Okay, thanks. But we will tell them what the overall statistics are, but we won't share you are level two and the team right next to you is level three. That we won't do. Um, this is more of a curiosity question, I guess, about management style of the organization. You talk about how every team is allowed to kind of run things the way they want to run. And it sounds like you're using very much a carrot approach versus a stick approach, you know, forcing something down their throat. But at the end of the day, I mean, there's, you know, a lot of other businesses, you know, you have like compliance requirements and so on. And I'm guessing that that's not in, in the picture for you guys. So is each individual team managed based on like revenue generated? Like, is there some accountability in terms of the negative impact of something they, you know, they're not doing doing things right in a secure way and it impacts some level of performance. Like, is there some kind of a measurement there? So Riot in general, teams aren't really measured on, uh, uh, on, on revenue that teams create because teams operate in, some teams operate in areas where they cannot generate revenue. Um, however, we do make teams aware of, hey, these are your bug bounty costs, these are your review costs, and those kind of statistics are dripping through. Uh, but that's also a slow change of culture because four years ago we wouldn't have been able to do that. And right now, as companies maturing, those kind of practices are more becoming more acceptable. All right. Thank you very much.